This is the Chem 1 lecture over ionic bonding. Um, so we are going to go through and talk about what ionic bonding is, um, what it looks like, and some of the properties or characteristics of it. Um, so in order to be able to talk about um, bonding, though, let's do a little bit of a review. So first we have the octet rule. Um, you see that word octet, and you should be thinking eight, right? This is that rule that all atoms um, are going to um, bond or interact in ways in order to have a fulfilled octet or eight valence electrons. So um, eight valence electrons is the big idea there. Um, valence electrons, remember those are the electrons in the outermost energy level. Um, and that magic number again is eight. We want, um, that's the outermost energy level electrons. The outermost electrons. Um, and electronegativity is um, an atom's tendency to attract electrons to itself when in a bond. So um, certain elements tend to attract or hog those electrons more than others. So first, um, chemical bonding in general. A uh, chemical bond is a force that holds atoms together. Um, and according to the octet rule, atoms form bonds with other atoms so that they have eight valence electrons um, in their outermost energy level. That's that ideal number. Um, because completed out of energy levels are the most stable with the lowest potential energy, um, atoms without eight valence electrons are going to react with each other in order to fulfill that outer um, eight valence electrons. So it's the most stable and it has the lowest potential energy. Um, and that magic eight in that outer shell is considered a noble gas configuration because they are isoelectronic with noble gases, that stable outer energy level. Um, um, some atoms bond with a lot of different substances, some don't. Um, whether or not substances bond with others um, depends on those number of valence electrons. Um, there's kind of two general ways that atoms can complete those outer energy levels. Um, they can transfer valence electrons, so they can just give them, boy, one can give away atoms to, or electrons to another, or they can share their valence electrons. Those are the two major types of bonding we're going to talk about. You can determine um, the type of bond um, based on those electronegativities of those two elements involved. So remember, electronegativity is the tendency to attract electrons to yourself um, when in a bond. So the element that has the most electronegativity is fluorine. So our electronegativity increases as we go across the periodic table and up a group. So um, two elements that have similar electronegativities, um, that means they're going to the uh, attract electrons equally. Um, that's considered a covalent bond. For example, if you and your friend um, both needed to use um, your chemistry textbook, you both attracted that book to yourselves, odds are um, you're going to have to share that book. You're going to have to sit next to each other, have the book open between you, and share it. Um, if, if you have a situation where one element has a high electronegativity and one has a low, so let's say you already finished your chemistry homework, but your buddy really, really needs that chemistry book because they, they haven't done their homework yet, um, you're going to end up with a transfer of electrons because you don't really need it, they really do need it. Um, that's considered an ionic bond. So there's two different types. We've got covalent bonds, which happens when there's similar electronegativities. And then you have ionic bonding that happens when you have an element that is high and another element that has a low electronegativity. So for the next part, um, you will need a periodic table um, to look at these two elements we're giving you um, to determine whether or not it's going to be an ionic or covalent bond. So I'm going to use an I for ionic and C for covalent. So first we have lithium and nitrogen. So if you look those two elements up on your periodic table, you can see that they're on opposite sides. So lithium is all the way over on the left um, in family number one. So lithium has a low electronegativity. While nitrogen, um, way over pretty close to fluorine, has a relatively high electronegativity. So they have very different electronegativities. Um, nitrogen's really going to attract that electron, while lithium really isn't. So there's going to be a transfer of electrons here that is considered an ionic bond. Um, next we've got rubidium and oxygen. So find rubidium, find oxygen on your periodic table. It's going to be a similar situation. Uh, rubidium atomic number 37 is an alkali metal all the way in family number one. So that's going to have a really low electronegativity. Well, oxygen, same thing, right next to nitrogen, has a really high electronegativity. Oxygen is really going to attract that electron. Because of that, we're going to have another ionic bond. They have very different electronegativities. Next, we have not nitrogen and oxygen. So find those two guys on your periodic table. 
nitrogen has a relatively high electronegativity and oxygen also has a relatively high electronegativity. So because of that, they're pretty similar. They're both really going to attract those electrons to themselves. Because of that, this is a covalent bond. They're going to have to share their electrons. They both, they both are really pulling on it. Um, and the last one, you guys tried this one, uh, carbon and fluorine. Look it up in your periodic tables um, and determine what bond type it would be. So um, this one, carbon and fluorine, both, they're pretty close to each other on the periodic table. So they have similar electronegativities. I'd consider that covalent. And if, there is a pattern here. Um, if you look at the two that are ionic, we've got a metal in those. So here are metals. And um, the ones that are covalent, if you notice, these are both nonmetals. So let me highlight the nonmetals green here so you can see the pattern. So um, the ones that are ionic are made up of a metal and a nonmetal. And the ones that are covalent are made up of only nonmetals. So there is a pattern to this. So an ionic bond um, is going to be between a metal and a nonmetal, which results in a transfer of electrons. One element's really pulling on those electrons, the other one's not, so there will be a transfer. Um, metals do tend to lose those electrons. Um, remember, those guys do have one, two, or three valence electrons with lower numbers. And they lose um, to form cations, which are positively charged ions, while nonmetals tend to gain those electrons. Remember, nonmetals have five, six, or seven valence electrons, so they're going to choose to gain um, to get up to eight, and those are called anions. So um, the chemical bond that's formed is an electrostatic uh, attraction because you've got a negatively charged nonmetal a positively charged metal. So you've got a positive and negative there. There is attraction there between opposite charges. Um, the result is electrically neutral though, because we do have a positive. For every positive we have, we have a negative. So it is overall neutral, although there is that attraction between positive and negative. Um, ionic bonds, um, it is called a formula unit. Um, so you'll see that again. Um, and that would just be the smallest possible um, unit for an ionic bond. So here we are just further illustrating this idea. So metals have low numbers of valence electrons, so they do lose them to fulfill their octet. So typically we'd say magnesium has only two valence electrons, so if it were going to be in a situation um, to fulfill its octet, it is going to choose to lose those two valence electrons, keeping in mind that the next energy level in is a full octet um, underneath it. Um, Nonmetals, they have low numbers of valence electrons, excuse me, high numbers of valence electrons, um, so they're much closer to eight, they're gonna choose to gain. So in this situation, sulfur has two spots sitting open for electrons. Magnesium is trying to lose two, so guess what? Magnesium's two electrons can fulfill um, sulfur's octet. So when we do that, magnesium loses two valence electrons, so losing two negatives means magnesium all of a sudden is gonna have a positive chew charge. It's gonna become a cation there. Sulfur, if it gains those two electrons, it now gained two more negative electrons, it will have a negative two charge. So here's an example of what a Lewis dot diagram could be used to show a transfer of an electron. So in this one, I can see sodium has one valence electron. So again, it's a metal, low numbers, it's going to lose it. Chlorine, sitting here with seven valence electrons, will gain that electron. So we can see I've got an arrow showing a transfer of those electrons, and then at the end, I've got my two ions, um, sodium, uh, each of them in brackets. Um, sodium now has no electrons around it. Keep in mind that the next shell in is full, so it is stable. Um, it lost an electron, so it became plus one in charge. Chlorine, it's now got all eight, so it's got, um, we, this one's in color, you won't have to do it in color, obviously, um, but it's got seven that are its own, that green one is the one that came from sodium, it gained an electron, it's got a negative one, and we went ahead and showed um, eight dots around it to show that it fulfilled that energy level. So let's practice. So um, the first one on your notes is potassium and sulfur. So you're gonna need a periodic table handy. Um, you can see potassium, is in family number one, so it has one valence electron. There it is. And then we've got sulfur. So let's just do a plus sign and sulfur. If you look that up on your periodic tables, it is in family number 16. So it's got six valence electrons. The first two go together. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so it's got, uh, needs two more. So I would say, okay, cool. I know this metal, potassium is gonna lose that electron. I can draw it 
oop, going over to sulfur. And now potassium is nice and happy. It's stable. Um, we know that that next energy level is um, full, so it's stable, but sulfur, not so much. Now it has seven valence electrons, and we know it really needs eight. So we can add as many potassiums as we need, right? In real life, you would never have one atom of anything. We have a beaker that has millions and millions and millions of them. So cool, let's just draw another potassium here and it's got one valence electron and we know it's gonna lose that valence electron. So let's draw an arrow of it going to the other missing spot next to sulfur. Now that potassium is fulfilled. So now at this point, everybody's got a stable octet. We know the two potassiums have lost their electrons so they're stable with that next energy level N being full. And now sulfur's gained two electrons so it's now stable. So now we can show the uh, ratio here. So it took two potassiums, so I'm gonna put that bracket, put potassium, and we know it lost, each of them lost one valence electron, so it's got a plus one charge. And then the other one is sulfur, so I'm gonna do a plus sign, draw sulfur here with a negative two charge. So first let's draw sulfur, it's nice and happy. It's now got eight valence electrons and a negative two charge. So my ratio is two potassiums for every one sulfur. We do need for it to be neutral, um, and it does work out that way. Um, if I have two potassiums that are plus one, that's a total of plus two, right? Two times plus one. I have one sulfur, um, and it has a negative two charge. So I have a total of plus two from potassium and a total of minus two from sulfur. So it is electrically neutral. Um, our next example is aluminum and iodine. So um, let's see, aluminum on your periodic tables, if you look that guy up, it has three valence electrons. So we're gonna draw aluminum with three electrons. First two go together, the last one by itself. And then our other element is iodine. So you gotta look iodine up on your periodic tables. It's a halogen, so it's got seven valence electrons, so iodine. First two go together, the rest of them separate them out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. So I know iodine's looking to gain one. So why don't we go ahead and take one of aluminum's valence electrons and whoop, draw it over there. Iodine now is stable. It has eight valence electrons. Aluminum though, not so much. Aluminum still got two. So we need to draw another electron acceptor. And in this case, our electron acceptor is iodine. Same thing, iodine's gonna have seven valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now I chose to make the um, open spot on the top so I can more easily draw an arrow, but it does not make a difference. Um, and let's take one of aluminum's electrons and draw an arrow over there. Okay, iodine's now got eight electrons, it's stable, but Aluminum still got one more. So another electron acceptor, another iodine. Draw it seven electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's gonna be drawing the last electron from aluminum. Now at this point, aluminum is stable. It has lost all three of its valence electrons and I have three iodines, each of them gaining one. So now we need to draw our ratio. So this took one aluminum and it became plus three. Close my bracket. It took three iodines. Each iodine ended up with that outer shell full and it gained one electron, so it's minus one. Now, you guys try the last one. Go ahead and pause the video, give it a try, um, and check your answer with mine. So this one took a second. So on this problem, um, I started out with uh, nitrogen and magnesium. So when I did that, um, nitrogen has five valence electrons, magnesium has two. So you can see that I drew two magnesiums being lost, or excuse me, electrons by magnesium being lost and accepted by nitrogen. So magnesium was stable, but nitrogen still needed another electron. So I had to draw them another magnesium, something that was gonna give away electrons, and two, draw, two valence electrons on the magnesium, whoop, one being accepted by nitrogen. So that meant nitrogen was fulfilled and my first magnesium was fulfilled, but now my second magnesium still had one more valence electron. So I had to draw another electron acceptor. I had to draw another nitrogen. Whew. So then I drew its five valence electrons and then magnesium got to give away its last electron and it was stable, but then nitrogen wasn't because it still needed two more electrons. 
So I did have to draw another magnesium to make that happen. So this one took a second because I had to draw one, two, three magnesiums. Each of them became plus two in charge because each one of them lost two valence electrons. And then it required two nitrogens, um, each nitrogen gaining three electrons, so it has a negative three charge. Still electrically neutral because three times positive two is positive six. And then for nitrogen, two times negative three is negative six. So it's still um, neutral overall. So uh, the last little bit of your notes is just going over properties of ionic bonds. So remember that is a transfer of electrons um, between positive and negative. So um, you are going to end up with really specific uh, characteristics of these guys. So it's always going to be between a metal and a non-metal. So you can, be able to, you can see where they are in the periodic table. If you're going to be making up a, a, a compound with a metal and a non-metal, then uh, very different electronegativities, it's going to be an ionic bond. Um, they typically exist as solids at room temperature, um, as a lattice or crystalline structure. Um, and you guys learned about in the last unit, sizes of ions. This is just a good review. So you can see that my cations, my positive guys, are a little smaller, okay, because they're losing those electrons. Like also, with more protons and electrons, it's, um, it's going to have a stronger pull on those outer energy electrons, resulting in a size that's smaller. Um, your anions and negative guys, look how they're bigger. Same thing, because they've gained electrons. Um, each electron is feeling fewer pulls from the protons because there are more negative electrons than protons. Um, they're very brittle, typically, um, and that's because you have alternating positive and negative, right? That electrostatic attraction between positive and negative. So if you had a sharp blow and you were to um, misalign those positive and negatives, you'd end up with positive, positive, or negative, negative, and we know that like charges repel each other. Um, they do typically dissolve in water. We'll spend more time um, the next unit talking about why that's so, but they do dissolve in water. Um, since it is a really strong attraction, um, you do end up with things like high melting points. It takes a lot of heat um, to turn it into a liquid. And um, the same thing, it's low volatility, which means it's not easily vaporized. Um, it's hard to turn it into a gas because they're really attracted to each other. Um, they do conduct electricity, but it has to be um, in molten or aqueous states. So molten meaning melted. And aqueous means um, in water. And that's because in order to conduct electricity, a substance has to have free moving charged particles. So as a solid, not a lot of movement going on here. Um, if it's melted or dissolved in water, we've got free floating um, positive and negative charges, so electricity can travel through that. So here's just an example of that. So in this first column here, um, we've got distilled water, so it's just H2O. Um, and up here is a diagram of um, a little setup um, where you can test for the conductivity of different substances. We've got two different metal plates down here. They're not connected. Um, so even though if we have power running through this cord, um, it's not able to travel through the water, so you notice the light bulb does not glow. If you've got just a solid ionic substance, probably just table salt, um, you can see that still the light bulb is not glowing here. The electricity is not able to go through that substance. But if you notice you've got dissolved sodium chloride or some ionic substance, um, free moving charges, these guys can move. So if you notice, the light bulb is glowing.